Your story is waiting for you today. Your story has something new to say. But your story will only come out to play when you're alone. Alone. Alone in a room with invisible people. The following episode may contain swearing. Alone in a Room with Invisible People is brought to you by hollyswritingclasses.com. Hi, I'm Rebecca Gallardo, and I'm the host of Alone in a Room with Invisible People. I am here with author and teacher Holly Lyle, and today's topic is when you hate what you write, <laughs> which is <laughs> such a cheerful topic. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, before we get into that, Holly, what have you done this week? How was your week? Um, I had a really, really good week. Uh, I have been working on the owner's tale, and in spite of the fact that it's taking longer for me to finish than I had anticipated, um, my experiment in non-sequential writing, in which uh, I have been building just the owner's part of the story first, uh, which covers about, I, I, I'm guessing about 50 years of the owner's life. Wow. And yeah, that's, that's and I've been doing it scene by scene, and just doing that part of the story. This week, I finished up The Owner's Tale. I finally figured out who it was that the owner is. I mean, I knew I knew who he was, but I didn't know how he had become who he was. And I got his whole story, and my God. But anyway, uh, this week I'm doing Melly and Shea, or, or started doing the Melly and Shea scenes. And the Melly and Shea scenes take, by my best guess, about three to five hours. And they are interspersed. So I've got this storyline running about 50 years interspersed with this storyline running about five hours. And it's That's coming insane. together really cool. And I'm so excited about it. And I love it so much. And this is a new thing for me. So because I always write sequentially, but I didn't know what price the owner had paid to become who he is now. And yeah. I learned that. And seriously, oh my God. <laughs> so... Um, and then uh, I am working on lessons for how to write a novel. And this week, uh, well, I just want to talk about my students this week because this has been amazing. Um, I've, been, I've been writing lessons and they've been doing lessons. And the thing that they have been doing is building out from the artifact that they built in week one. And they are discovering all this amazing stuff that they didn't know they had built in, which is why you build the artifact. Uh, it's not so that you can put it in the book. You build the artifact so that it gets you out of your own way and lets you find a story um, naturally. It lets you find the story that's in your brain without having to slog around going, oh my God, what am I going to write about? And nobody is having that problem. <laughs> and that is really cool. So anyway, what about your week? Um, my week was pretty good. I've got, um, I'm doing the ghost anthology and I almost done with, I think number four, the, the fourth cool. story, but I'm aiming for six to put out in an anthology on October 1st and I'm just not sure it's going to happen. Uh, I have a whole bunch of artwork that I have to make for people. I have, uh, deadlines on all of those and, um, I also have... Uh, leaving Wandalusia, the second book in the Wandalusia world. And I know I've, I've said I've, I'm going to put that aside, but it's like the more I write other stuff, the more that one keeps coming back to me and telling me, okay, well, you got to get back to us. The muse wants what um, it wants. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm also going through how to write a novel, the course that you're working on. Like, and it's, it's drawing me towards this idea that I want to write too. And it's just so much all at once. And I want to go through that course while as you're writing it because I want to be part of um, that course in the beginning and I want to be able to help. But yeah, I want to be a part of the, the course as you're going through it because I want to be able to find different things that don't necessarily um, translate to me very well so that if people in the future are like me, then they're going through a course that I've helped kind of, you know, not fix, but give you the alternate point of view from somebody more like me so that that, that can be fixed in the future. Yeah, that or changed or 
that is the big benefit for me in doing a splinters version of the class. It's a lot of work because I'm going in and finding things that aren't connecting to people because they're saying, okay, well, I, but I don't understand what I'm doing this for, or I don't understand how this works. I don't even understand how to do this. And then I have to figure out how to translate what's in my head into something that other people in different brains can understand. And it's, but, but by doing that, it makes the course much more accessible to everyone who takes it in the future. It's just a little hard on the guys who are taking it right now. Well, it's also hard on you too, because you end up having to, it, it's not like you're putting out this course that works for everybody and then everybody can just take it. Mm -hmm. You, the, the splinters course is, is also amazing because the people that are in it understand that it might not work for them right away. Right. So then they so, come in and they post on the board and then I have to figure out path B, which, you know, we did that live session on YouTube, um, yeah. for path B for the first one. And then I had to do. Uh, something with the, with a second set of, of issues where I just posted that in the form and redid part of lesson two um, where I left something out because to me it was just perfectly logical. You do this and then you do this and I put the worksheets in there. Obviously everybody's going to know how to go from this one to that one. No. Yeah. <laughs> I lost everybody on that and fortunately everybody said, okay, but I don't know how to get from here to here. And I looked at it and I could see where I'd gotten from there to there, but I hadn't shown anybody else how. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah that's like the dot in the line that oh, confused God. the fuck out of a lot of people. Yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. And to me, that that is just the most. But see, that's because everybody has a different brain and everybody's yeah. brain is build it yourself. You know, yep. there's no toolkit. So you go in from the time you were born, you start building your brain. And your brain works differently than everybody else's on the planet. And the fact that we can communicate through writing is a freaking miracle. Yeah. <laughs> so speaking of communicating through writing, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, let's figure out what, what happens when you hate what you write. Okay. So go ahead and take it away. Yeah. Okay. Well, first off, that happens to everyone. And when I say everyone, I mean absolutely everyone. Sooner or later, you are going to write something. And it's going to start well, and it's going to, to go someplace where you think it's going to be awesome. And then you are going to do something that just makes you detest what you have written. And my example story for this is Talismana, where I had this really cool idea. It was based on you and your dog, Fred, man. Yeah, Fred. And yes, yeah. I know. I miss Fred. Uh, it was, and it was this opportunity to put you in a book and and well i mean it wouldn't be the first time i'd done it I, you were in a yeah. number of you are you and your brothers and now your brothers uh have been in a number of books that i have written but um the, it was just this this was me as an artist too. yes yes you as an artist yeah. back before you were actually doing doing anything significant with your art um, yeah yeah and it's all just mainly jewelry yeah and it was, um, it just, I put the wrong character in there and I made the wrong character essential to the story and the story just died on me. And it's there, you, you can do absolutely anything to make the book into something you hate and, or, or any story you can, you can do, you can break the plot, you can break a character, you can just um, look at your writing and start picking your writing apart and saying, oh my God, no, no real writer ever used that word. That's, yeah. um, where you just become hypercritical about, about every single comma and period. And, and it's, this is a normal part of writing. It's just a part that sucks and it's a part that you have to learn how to get past. So, I know you have written some things that you have not been. The the worst thing, I guess, that I could say was everything right after uh, fan fiction. Because I started off writing original fiction when I was 11 or 12. And not very good. <laughs> no, it's, it's 11 or 12 year old fiction. And I'm not a prodigy, so it's relatively bad. And I read a lot of Stephen King and Dean Koontz. So, um, 
you know, if it wasn't romance, it was these really weird, bizarre horror movie, like, books. And the, the transition into fan fiction came from um, Smallville, I think. Uh, no, there was first there was Law and Order. But it was just me turning into a teenager with a lot of hormones and then starting to write either these um, kind of more sensual things <laughs> <laughs> or you were looking at like a whole bunch of like crime mystery stuff and I got into that kind of drug of having a world already established having characters already established and it didn't matter I, I tried different I went through different genres and different um, characters different shows I wrote some things for Buffy and it was just all of my work was very popular not all of it but a lot of my work was very popular mm -hmm. I mean just this morning I still and this is what 23 20 well 20 20 years later roughly I just got another like on one of my <laughs> my stories at fanfiction.net and it's it's crazy um but it, it's it's there's this drug to that fan fiction and a lot of people never get out of it because it, it it's like a drug it can be addictive and then when you try to write your own original fiction it's so much harder that it there's it's more of a challenge because nothing is already built for you it's not like it, it, it's taking off that training wheel but going to a unicycle instead of a bike <laughs> yes <laughs> that's and a nice analogy <laughs> it's it's just it's very very difficult you have to you have to then you are responsible for the entire world and i found that a lot of my main characters were very drab and very boring and not good enough to to fill an entire book or an entire story or anything like that my side characters were always pretty much okay but it just, I had such an incredibly hard time, not transferring, but growing up as, as, as what I see is fan fiction was really nice trainer. It was a way to get my confidence up, to get my feedback, to, to see that I could create a story and work within characters that people, people love. Yeah. And you were, you were doing some pretty good work with plotting. You you never yeah. had a problem oh, yeah. of not telling the story. Um, you know, I yeah. I did read some of your stuff and you know, the sorry. stuff that no, that's okay. So <laughs> it was the stuff that you wouldn't mind me reading. I did. I missed the uh, the uh, Clark Lex Luthor. Clex. Yeah, Clex. Yeah. Yes, Clark Lex. Uh, yeah, that's actually one of the ones that just got favored this morning was Lex and the Lamborghini. <laughs> but yeah, there's a lot of them um, were yes. I, I I I had fun with those, but they were they were. Not inappropriate. They were inappropriate for mothers. Yeah, they were not stuff your mom wanted to read. I guarantee you. No. <laughs> yeah, but all of them. Yeah, that's true. I did. I had a really good idea of pacing. Mm -hmm. I had a really good idea of plotting. I got. Um, it just. It. I, a lot of it came naturally. A lot of it, I'm sure, came from having a writer as a mother, reading all the time, also watching a lot of shows, fitting pacing to the shows. Mm -hmm. So I'm. I'm really adaptable. I'm very, very good at at learning from what I see. And that's that's just what I needed to do with the um, with writing original work. It's just so much harder. It is so much more difficult to create, you know, original fiction. So I ended up hating <laughs> all the stuff that I was writing for the longest time. And I couldn't go back to fan fiction. I kept trying. Yeah. But my brain, I had decided I had grown up, you know, and, and not to be insulting to anybody still writing fan fiction. That was just what my brain had decided. My, mm -hmm. I guess my left brain, my left brain got tired of writing fan fiction. It was like, no, you, you have the, the capacity to create stuff on your own. So I just was not inspired by fan fiction anymore. Even a couple of years ago when I started to have um, some depression and was fighting my original stuff I thought okay well I could just go back and write a little bit of fan fiction to get my juices flowing again no 
didn't work. Yeah. I, I have to write original fiction now. So you just, there's growing pains. Yeah. You know? And I think that um, that's one area where you can end up writing a lot of what you hate. But I also hated leaving Wanda Lucia for a little while. <laughs> yes, you did. And the thing is, Wanda Lucia, was, leaving Wanda Lucia is really good. It's So the fact that you hated that was one of the other problems that people have, which is you were too close to your own work and you were being hypercritical and not seeing yeah. what you had done right. And there were some areas in it where it, it, it wasn't, flawless but the core story and the characters and the progression the conflicts the the romantic back and forth uh, your villain that, that was all really strong stuff and it was fun to read and Yay. yeah and that's um that's the key right there but you were just too close to it and that's one of the things that a lot of people face is you're too close to your own work and you're not seeing what what you've made because you just finished making it and it's still steaming and you haven't walked away. <laughs> yeah. And you, your, your description of it steaming is, um, <laughs> it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a lot of people would agree with that. Yes. yes, it is steaming. Yes. But see, that's just it is you can't see what you've left behind and there's going to be a certain amount of stuff that's got to be shoveled out. But there is going to be some really good stuff in there, too. So there is, there is this, this thing where you are going to look at your work at some point and hate it. So you have to realize that no matter how much some of it may genuinely suck, and as someone who has written a whole lot of stuff that genuinely sucks, I can tell you, there, there, you're right, there you are right in that there is some stuff in there you're going to have to fix. But you have to step away because there is always something in your work that is worth saving. And it might not even in your early work be something really big. It might be, okay, again, I'm going to go back to Tater Amu. Oh, no, I knew that was coming. Yes, oh, God, <laughs> because, because she was the first good character I ever made. She was in the first good world I ever built. And she was in a story that was a steaming pile of crap. Um, it really, oh my God, it was horrible. And, and, you know, Dragon Dankmeyer was. <laughs> Do you have this story? Because no. at this point you have mentioned everything so many times people want to read it. No, I, it's, that was, it was handwritten. It was before, oh. it was while I was, t actually, no, it was typed. It was typed on a manual typewriter on an old upright Underwood that I bought so that I could teach myself to type. And I had painted all of the keys on this manual underwood white and put a little block of with the keyboard layout up in front of me to keep my eyes up. And I would look at, from my keyboard layout, tape to the wall in front of me, down to my boards to make sure that I was hitting the right keys. And yeah, yeah and I was teaching myself to type while writing that story. Yeah, you, to you told me that's how you learned to type, and I copied you and learned to type myself like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. well, I was, I was not going to take typing when I was in high school because that was the path to being a secretary back in the 1970s, and I had determined that's not where I was going. So I was just, if you don't know how to type, you can't be a secretary. Voila. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. No, so, no problem. Yes. Et voila. <laughs> I, have, I have solved the problem. No. <laughs> but anyway... Yeah, that, that story does not exist, and, and you may thank me later. But that story has become part of the owner's tale, the part of it that was worth saving. Um, good God, almost 30 years later? Yeah, it's 30. Holy shit, yes. <laughs> yes, from when I was 20, it's, been, it's 32, because I was 25 when I was working on that thing. Jesus. Anyway... <laughs> Yeah, so you you will make some things that are worth saving and might be worth becoming something that is this piece of an epic years later, but to get that kind of perspective, you have to walk away and not destroy it. And the temptation to destroy something that you see as horrible can be enormous. I try to tell people not to destroy their artwork too. Yeah. Because a lot of people 
they even pieces of paper that they draw on and i think this came from you because you're always saying you know don't throw it away and it's the same thing with writing i think that's what you were teaching us yes but then even with my drawings you were telling me <clears throat> don't throw these away because you want to see them someday right and as much as i hated a lot of them i still kept them and i'm glad that i did and i i see oh you know i threw it away it's like no freaking save that right it, you might be mad at where you are now but you'll grow and with writing some of those story ideas are not that bad right right some of you you can have magnificent ideas and simply not yet have the skills to write them and that's okay if you hang on to what you have written you can go back later and and dig it back out and go okay well this sucks but the idea is great and i can use that in this thing that i'm doing now with these better skills that i have now and also the other thing is you can say, oh my God, I've gotten better. If you have yep. the old stuff there, you can look at it and go, oh, wow, I so don't <laughs> suck like I used to. I am so much better than I used to be. You're and laughing. you know what? It doesn't even, yeah, I'm laughing because I've been there. <laughs> I'm laughing because I, I literally, I got so excited. Remember when I was going through all that paperwork because I was minimalizing mm -hmm. and I was telling you about mm -hmm. it? I found the first erotica I ever wrote. Mm -hmm. I think I was 14 <laughs> or 15 or 16, something like that. And I had this huge crush on Jon Stewart from The Daily Show. Oh, my God. And I will say, in the 90s, he was very cute. <laughs> and I don't know why I had a crush on him. It, it, it was just the hormones. You know me and my crushes. Mm -hmm. Most of them lasted 20 minutes. Yes. So Except for Gary Oldman. I... I, I, I don't don't speak ill of my man. <laughs> that is my other husband. <laughs> he just doesn't know it. <laughs> Tony is aware, however. Okay. But um, yeah. So I I found this this horrible horrible thing. I was so excited. I was like, oh my god, I can't wait to read it because I remember writing it to two Melissa Etheridge songs. Um, and every time I hear those songs. I am, I feel like I want to write some erotica or I think about that story. And it's just, I, I, it was God awful. <laughs> <laughs> I remembered it being full of tension and there being this taboo because I was, you know, I was writing about sex Ooh. <laughs> and I was a kid, you know, I was a teenager. So of course, you know, and I was a goody two shoes teenager. So <laughs> I know nothing about that stuff. Um, but it was just horrible and it made me feel good because it was so cute uh -huh. it was it was so much growth but even if i had looked at that that piece even a year later it would have shown me how much growth i had had in just a single year right right and and i will note that i knew i was aware that both of my children were writing erotica when they were oh, in their yes. early teens. This was not anything that they were doing behind my back. It, nope. my, my take on it was, hey, I know where they are. I know what they're doing. If they want to write erotica, that's okay with me. <laughs> yeah, you explained to a six-year-old where babies came from. Yes, I did. Me, with Tinker Toys, and your, your philosophy has always been, just be honest. <laughs> so we definitely didn't hide the fact that we were writing erotica. No. Nope. So <laughs> I knew. <laughs> yeah. And I but did yeah, not you're right. You're absolutely right. There is this this growth that happens and you want to save everything and you don't know what you could end up using later because I have gone back and pulled out story ideas that have been in my head for certain elements of different like a screenplay that I had uh, written Silver Lining when I was 19, 17. Mm -hmm. I think I finished it. And like those stories there are elements that stayed with me that I have put into other things that have been finished now. Right. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's, there is always something worth saving. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there is something worth saving, whether it's worth saving to look at later and go, well, I've gotten better or, oh my God, I know what to do with this now. 30 some years later, 30. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. So, the thing here is is that your job is to figure out which it's it's and it's to give yourself the room in which to figure out 
witch? Is it something that I'm going to look back at later and, and laugh and say, oh, I was such a cute kid, I've grown? Or is it something that you're going to look back later and go, oh my God, um, this, now I know what to do with it. Um, and I do have to say, I thought when I started writing, I thought everything I wrote was brilliant. Okay? I was. I've never been there. I was at the absolute other end of the spectrum where <laughs> I, I was unable to see how bad what I was writing was. And I thought that everything was just amazing and brilliant and groundbreaking and brand new. <laughs> and then as I started writing more and learning, I would go back and go, oh my God, how did I ever think that was good? Holy crap. And that's part of why it took me seven years to learn how to do a revision is initially, I didn't see anything wrong with what I'd written. I was reading it and going, oh my God, this is great. You know, this is as good as everything I'm reading out there. And the fact that it might have been as good as a couple of the things that I was reading out there is just sad. It does, <laughs> doesn't speak very much for the things you were reading. No, then. it does not speak well for, for what I was reading. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and it took me a while to understand my limitations and to recognize my limitations and then to learn how to, become, to, to move beyond them. Because if you think everything you are doing is great or even good or even readable and you are new, um, the odds are that you were coming at it from my direction and not Becky's, where Becky, Becky was under no illusions and I thought I was the next god of writing. <laughs> and uh, it, took, it took me having uh, a, a professional writer named Stephen Lay to read through what I had written. And, uh, oh, uh, and um, maybe, you know, a hundred editors that I nearly killed in a couple of magazines that I did <laughs> <laughs> by sending them my terrible stories. And Charles Ryan's uh, sending me back this rejection note that said, much, 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 much too much exposition. I had to count the muches. That one always kills me. Yes. That one always kills me. I'm like, fuck, I love that. Yes. <laughs> and and to let you understand where I was in my writing at the time, I had to then look up exposition because I didn't know what it was. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Becky is laughing so hard she has tears running down her cheeks right now. I am just <laughs> letting you know. I'm sorry. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that story, I don't know how many times, I've, it, it slays me every time. <laughs> yes, well, you know, if you are the great god of uh, writing, and you don't know what exposition is, step back, yeah. step away from the keyboard, you have a little learning to do. I just, I just have this picture of this dude reading this story and going like, oh, yes. god. Oh. And then just writing that many muches. <laughs> He got me again. <laughs> yes, there were five. I had, I did. I had to sit here and count off on my fingers to make sure I had all five muches before the last much. And I wish you still had that one. And Charles Ryan, bless his heart, was the man who who gave me a career because after I looked up exposition and found out what I had done wrong, um, I I started actually learning how to not suck. <laughs> And he was the guy who bought both of my sonnets too. Oh, yes, cool. my 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 Aww. my little sex bot sonnet and my uh, computer hard drive crash sonnet. I I hope he. I'm gonna stop linking those in the show notes because you're just gonna mention them every three episodes anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I I like the fact that I I hope he noticed that you were the same one that that had you know all the muches oh. all the muches exposition yeah that would be really cool that would because but I, he probably didn't that's that i i owe that man <laughs> he yeah. was after more than 100 rejections he was he was the single best rejection i ever got which was that one which told me what i did wrong although i had to look it up to find out yeah yeah and it was helpful yes so so that man best rejection i ever got and first two sales I love him. I don't know where he is right now, but I love that man. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. So there's always something worth saving, you said. So what is, ha how do we look at what we've written 
what we hate in our writing how do we figure out what it is that's that's driving us crazy or what it is that we hate and how to maybe fix it okay there there are basically there are a few steps to this none of them are terribly difficult um some of them are a little bit are a little bit tough but the first one is really really simple just walk away let the story get cold and depending on how new you are um let the story get cold for longer if you are brand new if if you have not been writing for four or five years um i I would say you would need to have maybe 20 or 30 stories written before you start developing enough of a sense of who you are as a writer to to be able to trust your own judgment even a little bit okay that that first that first 20 or 30 stories and i know that sounds like a lot it isn't um over over the period over a period of a lifetime um you can write thousands of stories so and and probably will if you if you love this and if this is what you want to do you are going to write uh i've written at this point tens of millions of words of fiction and um you just you 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 don't have any objectivity when you first start so write more stories but put the stories that you have written away unread and let them sit for a while while you're writing more stories so that by the time you go back and read the first one you have maybe four or five other stories written go develop a cycle short stories and this is where flash fiction is really good is that you can develop stories very quickly and do maybe 10 flash fiction stories and then go back and read the first one and you have been getting progressively a little better with each story but you need that breathing room um, yeah, that's what I was doing with the pen name that I was self-publishing. Yes. I would write a story, set it aside, write another story, set it aside. By the time I was working on the third story and finished it, I would go back to the first one, edit it, and send it to the betas. I had I had a very good system going on. Yeah. Yeah, and you were producing a lot of work, and your work was selling. And yeah, you were just, you were developing a fan base there. Yeah. Yeah, Barnes & Noble just switched up their... their um, terms of service with self-publishing writers and kicked, God, like 70% of the um, romance and erotica genre out. And I was just one of those that got kicked out. Yeah. So I, you know, I could go back, but I'm moving on to writing stuff in my actual name. Right. So, right. Well, but yeah, that, I had a cycle going. And by the time I finished the third story, the first one was cool enough that I found all sorts of errors I could find any plot holes, anything that I didn't like. But, you know, so that's something that if you get into a a regular schedule with, it's something that can stick with you and end up being very beneficial to your career. Yeah. Yeah, that's that was one of the problems that I had starting out too was that I didn't realize a personal letter from an editor telling me what was wrong with what I had written was a good thing. I didn't realize that I had made enough of a connection that that editor saw at least a tiny bit of promise in me. So I didn't revise. I didn't go back afterwards and fix the story or rewrite the story. So I had this long, slow growth period because I didn't know there were other things that I could do. Um, I just wrote a story. I would send it out. I would send it to maybe three or four different places. It would get rejected at all of them. And then I would not go back and rewrite it because... It was just, to me, the story, once it was written, was done. And it didn't occur to me for ages that, no, that was just a first draft. And it, like I said, seven years, seven years to learn how to revise, following which uh, everything started selling. Um, but, you know, that's, we're, we're trying to, to get you out of that um, process and into, okay, well, let me, let me learn how to get better now, not seven years from now. So, so the first step is become objective, right? Just step Step away, away. work on something else. Right. The second step is to become scientific. Okay. And this sounds very cold and hard and uh, shiny stainless steel. And to a certain extent it is, you have to, the objectivity with your work requires that you understand what has to be in a good story. 
And what has to be in a good story is protagonist, antagonist, um, conflict, setting, twist, and then tone and theme. And, <clears throat> excuse me, when you have this, then you have at least the pieces of a good story. And until you have this, you're writing something that's broken. So you have to understand that you have to have a good guy, um, a bad guy, or a conflict of some something, something that your, your main character has to overcome. Uh, you have to have a place in which this occurs. You have to have uh, a, a change, something that the reader does not expect that resolves the problem. Uh, you have to have a theme, something that the story is about that is bigger than just the, the character's actions. Um, you have to have um, this passion, and you have to have a voice. You have to have, um, whether you're, you're telling it in a jokey, smart-ass fashion, or well, whether you're being suspense, suspenseful and dead serious, that's your tone. And, and you go through and you look at each of these pieces and you say, okay, is this here? Do I have a protagonist? And is the protagonist something somebody else is going to want to read about and hope to see succeed? because there are an awful lot of horrible protagonists in, in beginner fiction. People that, the writer is trying to go to be dark and deep and complex, and he ends up writing, or she ends up writing, this jerk, this, this complete, total, unlikable asshole who you want to see die. And if the writer's ending is then the, the cliched, uh, and then he died, everybody goes, yay, and nothing more by that writer. Thank you, and I'm on my way. So you don't want to be the writer who writes that story. You want to give the reader someone to care about and make your character wonderful in some way. I'm not saying you have to write perfect people. You don't have to write Mary Sue's. You don't have to write the person that, that, that has no flaws. Please don't. Yeah, please Mary don't, Seuss. in fact. But, but you have to give the reader a reason to give a shit about whether your character lives or dies, and you don't want them to be giving the shit in hoping that the character will die. You just yeah. don't want to write that character, because that's... Unless it's a bad guy. Right. Okay, well, now, if you were... If you were but see, stories written from the point of the view of the villain are very, very hard for most readers to get into. Oh, I wasn't thinking about the point of view, oh, but you okay. can have a point of view, too, where it's still <clears throat> not the main character, but it's a villain. Oh, right, where you have the antagonist. Yeah. 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 Yes. You can You um, can always give the reader somebody to, to hate or fear or to be their worst nightmare. And that will. Con and, and if you then give your main character a way to deal with that character, um, they're happy because that's if you if you have hit their night, their worst nightmare and given your main character a way to get around that and survive, you win. <laughs> my, my problem was always uh, the protagonists and the conflicts. Usually my, my antagonists were good. I had good settings. I had decent little twists, you know, sometimes. Mm -hmm. But just the main characters that I used to write were so bland, I guess because I was used to that fan fiction where the characters are already built and they have all of their... Um, the the personal twists and personal things that that create conflict with each other mm -hmm. so i know that that was really really hard trying to write main characters that i liked i enjoyed all my secondary characters were always always pretty good um but but yeah that was that and and finding conflict like you said it's not argument so you have to find ways to incorporate conflict however th it it was really if you're objective and you are being scientific, you can start to narrow down and find out what's wrong in your story. It does not take that long. Yeah. Most of the time. I know sometimes it can be trickier. And you have with with Leaving Wanda Lucia, since that's the most recent thing I have read by you, um, you got past that. because and, and the way you did it, I think, is really telling. Is you took a lot of pieces of your own personal existence, your own personal struggle. You transmuted them so that they are not the same in the character, but because I know you, I, I know where they came from in your life and what fueled these various things. And I can see what you did that 
that changed them into this, this stranger, who nonetheless is a very real and very likable main character, who has a compelling story that is very different from yours, but nonetheless very real. And I still think I could work on personalities a little bit more, but I think that that's just something that all writers, um, you know, you just have to keep growing with your work. Yeah. Nothing's going to ever be perfect. Perfect is, uh, what, what is it in How to Think Sideways? Oh, perfect is yeah. Safe? Perfect is the I, I actually I don't remember. It's yeah. yeah. Perfect never finishes. Perfect never finishes. Yeah. yeah. So that's you're never going to send your work out if you're waiting for it to be perfect because you will always grow. You will always get better. There's there is no perfect. Right. Right. That's, but yeah. And I think that's so, one of the beauties of writing, is that while there yeah. is no perfect, there is most definitely good enough. And yeah, and you always get better. Yes, you, there's always this opportunity to grow and learn more and get. Yes, better. there is. There is no best book you will ever write, except your next one, because you can yes. always do. You know, this one is the best I can do right now. Great, awesome. Okay, but the next one is going to be the best I can do right now, and it's going to be better. And the next one, yes. and it's it's. I love that about writing. It there is just no top end. There's no point at which you go, okay, well, I can't do any more with this. <laughs> <laughs> so after becoming scientific, what, what goes, what's the next step? You have to study what works. Um, and this is not just what works in your own writing. This is what works in other people's writing. And not just in the genre you read, but in genres you don't read. And in fact, more importantly, in genres that up until now you have not read, because one of the coolest things that happens for a writer is that you can read um, a bunch of nonfiction, a bun bunch of fiction in genres you have never read, and you will find out shit you never even imagined existed in, in both nonfiction and fiction that then it starts to set up camp in the back of your mind it gives your muse new toys to play with and all of a sudden you are the person in how to write a novel who is uh sitting there going well but i don't know where this is coming from because i have never written fantasy in my entire life and all of my artifacts are giving me fantasy I, like okay listen to your muse let's let's go ahead but so you study you you expand on what you know and then you also learn things like uh you learn what a theme is and a theme is um it is the reason that you're writing the book uh, and the subtext is the hidden story um okay i'm going to go back to bones of the past because bones of the past uh has a, a deep subtext to it it was my frustration with being raised deeply religious by missionary, by on again, off again, lay missionary parents. I don't want to give anybody the impression my parents were ministers. They weren't. But they were, um, they were dorm parents at a, a children's home in Alaska. They were um, going to be the financial officer and a, like the guest house uh, supervisor at, in a friend's a Quaker mission in Guatemala. Uh, we were in Costa Rica, and um, I was raised not just with religion, but with a an ever changing series of religions. And I, you know, read the whole Bible through, straight back to front, three times, three times, read every word of that thing. And the effect it had on me, I'm not going to get into that, but. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's in Bones of the Past. That's the, yes, the but theme of it. but my. The story of my fight with religion became this subtext in Bones of the Past. And it's a, it also my experiences with jungles in Central America, which scared the ever-loving crap out of me. People were going, oh, yes, the rainforest. Oh, no, not the rainforest. I've been there, my friend. <laughs> it's a scary damn place. So... Um, it was, it was tough, but I worked the religious angle into these trees. And then I, I wrote the book and I buried it deep because the, the thing you don't want to do if you have a theme and if you have a subtext is you don't want to hammer your reader over the head with it. 
You want it to be in there for you, yourself, so that you know why you're writing the book. But how anybody else interprets it is entirely up to them. And so, so yeah, a friend of mine read the book. Her husband had just died of cancer. He was younger than her. He was young. He was in his late 20s, early 30s, and had just died of cancer. And she was absolutely devastated. And she read the book. And what she got out of it was this sense of, okay, this is a metaphor for cancer, and this is how you survive as the person who lost somebody to cancer. And and that was not what I had put in the story at all. But it was. Wow. Right. Because that's what subtext does. So if you learn, you, you are going to study what works and you are going to learn how to create these pieces that work. And you build them out of your life. You build your tone, your theme, your subtext out of who you are. And then you bury it so deep that people can take whatever they need to find out of it. And, and you're, you, you have no control over that, but you don't want control over that. Because you so that's studying what works. That's right, trying to find other people that have done theme, tone, subtext, right. stuff like that. Right, and okay. digging and digging through that and reading more. And the only thing you can do as a writer that is ever going to pay you back beyond anything you imagine is to read way outside of the genre in which you write. Way, way, way. And outside read nonfiction, of nonfiction too. Yeah. Oh yeah. God, yes, yes. That's nonfiction. A good nonfiction is well good nonfiction is everything from the point of view of a fiction writer it's everything you don't know and can learn um yeah yes and then after that once once you have read more broadly and once you have looked at what you're doing you identify what broke and this is essentially learning how to revise but you know it's protagonist antagonist conflict twist setting theme um tone subtext all of that, you look at what you've written and you say, okay, this is the piece that broke because the odds are pretty good that you still had something good in there. And you want to save what's good and you only want to fix what broke. And then then you are not looking at at the scorched earth approach to writing fiction, which is, oh my God, this sucks, burn it, burn it, burn it now. And it's so tempting to do that too because I've gone through two revisions now and I've only finished the one. And the the temptation is, I'm just going to start over from scratch. <laughs> and I even saw people in the forum saying that too. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, don't, don't, don't do that. Because I've been where you've been or where you are. I had that feeling too. Mm-hmm. No, you can save what you wrote. It's more work to, to go back and start over from scratch because then you're going to go back to the revision and say, oh shit, I got to start over from scratch again. Mm-hmm. Right, right. The only thing that not finishing your work by revising it teaches you is how to quit. And most people already know how to quit. The, the, the thing you don't want to do is, you know, incorporate a process of, oh my God, this sucks, I quit, and then start over from scratch. Learn from your yeah. mistakes. And the only way you can learn from my sta- your mistakes is to first find them and to second fix them. Because once you have found your mistakes and have fixed your mistakes, then even if the story still doesn't sell, even if it still isn't a, a brilliant work of, of amazing fiction that changes the world and alters for all time the high watermark <laughs> upon which literature is built, okay? Even if it's just a cute little story. That is a a success for you. And it starts building this pattern of success in which you learn how to get better by identifying what broke and then learning how to fix it. It's like buying a new car every time your car breaks. Don't do that. Nobody can afford to do that. And you can't afford to do it either because you have a limited amount of time on this planet. And there are only so many stories you're going to get a chance to write. So yeah. you don't buy a new car every time the old car breaks. You learn how to fix the old car, get it up and running again, and drive it to the parking to the to the place where you start the new car. <laughs> <laughs> so you become so breaking it down so far, you're basically looking at I hate this piece. So you you step away from mm-hmm. it you, so you can have objectivity. You look at trying to identify in your story your scientific area you know your protagonist antagonist conflict setting right. setting and is twist. everything that the story needs to have in there yeah so you identify that then you you kind of take a little bit of time you, you try to find you say study what works so i'm assuming you you find things that were good in your genre mm-hmm. um 
trying to find something that and that's that's what I, I I've done too with some of the romance stuff is you're looking for something that was done well mm -hmm. that moves you maybe a favorite a favorite story would be good too to go back and then you identify what broke in your story um, with packs and theme subtext and tone right right absolutely okay. and then um, if, if you if you are just completely stymied you have you have gone through this thing and it's still it feels broken to you then you go to a this is and this is absolutely worst case you just you have absolutely no idea what's wrong with it you go to a trusted second opinion you go to somebody who for me it was Stephen Lay who read that story and it, and then you know Charles Charles Ryan with a story that I sent off that I thought was it was it was Quakers in space honest to god it was it was I had I had Quakers on a spaceship who were settling who were making a colony in space and I got into the whole friends um, history and how they got into space and there was no story there it was much 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 too much exposition but it's 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 putting your work in front of somebody who knows what good work is and and just to make a quick note here holly can't holly does not have time to to be the trusted second opinion uh, she i mean right now as of now she's even working 14 to 18 hour days or 16 hour days yeah, or something like yeah. that just to get everything she has done and this is this is pretty much every time she does a class too yeah. so yeah don't please don't email us asking for her to take a look at your work go to holly's forums there are places for you to go in and find some opinions there yeah. and th the mods and some of the writers on there are published there they are great oh i great have the help. best people on the internet in my forum yeah. honest to god they are yeah. wonderful so, people. yeah and we have strict rules and you know there is we have a no politics no religion rule it is absolutely ferociously guarded and uh because it is the thing that allows all of our people to stay warm and friendly with each other and be helpful and avoid the two things that broke the last community that i built and ran that had ten thousand people and that i walked away from in just sheer utter yeah so no yeah. politics no religion right. just writing and you you know got to follow the rules of critiquing in there so if you are somebody who's tender and new and you don't know where you're going wrong holly's forums they're free just create a free account yeah. you, you do get the flash fiction thing uh the flash fiction course and with this it. is a safe and place because anybody yes, who it is does safe. who uh, whoever attacks another writer is gone they no longer have yeah. access to the forums it is a hard and fast rule and we have specific rules on how to give critiques built into the terms of service and you need to read them but it is this is a safe place and a community of supportive writers who will not attack you and yeah yeah because yeah. <laughs> holly knows you know she she built it specifically because it, uh, this world needs a place like that. Yes. So, <laughs> um, all righty. So what else is there after, you know, trying to find a second opinion as long as it's trusted and, you know, what, what are we looking okay, at? Okay, well, you've basically, once you have heard back, then you have to take a deep breath. And there you have three alternatives at this point, okay? Because at the point where you are looking at the story and you have already passed by the urge to take a match and burn it um and you have maybe you have either identified what you think are the problems uh or have handed it off to somebody else who has for you identified the problems and you have been an adult about it and said okay well when they say that my my antagonist is is a wuss and my protagonist is an evil wench um then but they they have said it kindly and by giving me examples of places where the character actually did these things in the story with page numbers and everything so that I, I know this is a real thing, then you have three alternatives. You have the small approach, which is you can just rethink or rewrite the parts that broke. Um, you know, so overall the story stays the same, but you turn your main character from evil wench into somebody kind of likable, um, who maybe, you know, she still has some flaws, but you know, she's not Miss Perfect, but, um, she isn't, she isn't the devil in a dress. Um, 
the, th the second approach to that, if, if there were a lot of things wrong with it, uh, you save the pieces that you love for a new or different story where the story just simply did not work for you. But you have this one character and this one character sits in the back of your mind for 30 years, 32 years. Damn it. And, <laughs> and, and then the, the larger thing is you just save the whole story. The, if, if everything feels broken, but there's a reason that you loved it, just put it aside and walk away and do something new. After, yeah, because you might might not be ready to write that right, one. Right, right, because yeah. I have several stories that I just freaking love. And um, one of them is, is the story that's still tentatively titled Dreaming the Dead. And I woke up from a dream um, in which uh, my, my very first publisher said, look, you know, this is, this is what you need to write. And he had died a few years before. And so that's, you know, the, the dead do not show up in my dreams. And he did. And I went, oh, wow. And I woke up and it was still a good idea. If you wake up and you write the thing down and it's still a good idea, holy shit, that's a good idea. And yeah. yeah. So, and I'm still not quite there. I'm not yet ready for that story. But it's still there. And it's still in broken form on my hard drive sitting and waiting for me to go back and do it someday yeah that's cool yeah someday i'll get there so, so okay so um why don't you kind of wrap this up and give our people their takeaway okay um little takeaway here this is this is just the, the short quick first off remember no matter how much you hate what you have written right now nothing you write is wasted if worst case it is the absolute worst piece of dreck anyone ever created on the planet and that's highly unlikely because i know what i wrote um <laughs> and i doubt you beat me uh if it is terrible you still learn from doing it and your next chance is going to be an opportunity to do something better okay second Learn to save what's good. Learn first off to identify what's good and then to save it. Third, learn to understand why what's bad is bad. And for me, that was the toughest lesson because I thought everything I was writing was brilliant initially. And then I started learning what writing really was. And I had, I had to learn what exposition was before I could even break through to to learning how to tell the story. Up until that point, I was doing massive world building, essentially, and trying to sell that and killing editors and publications in the process. <laughs> and they were, they were going, I'm going it's, I, that's it, I'm becoming an alcoholic and going to hide, off, hide in a cave. <laughs> so you learn, to, you learn why what's bad is bad, and you learn to identify it in your own writing. And finally, you learn to use what you learn to get better so that even if what you're writing right now is crap and if you are new yeah, there are really pretty good odds that what you are writing right now is crap you save it you learn and you get better because very very few people become bestsellers with their first work and very very few people have the guts to finish enough stories to get good but you can do this yeah, and don't compare yourself to people that have gotten their first novel published and it went on to win a an award <laughs> or, you know, and I'm mocking Holly just here slightly, <laughs> but don't compare yourself to Holly. Don't compare yourself to other writers who were on the New York Best Time Seller because in their brand new. Don't compare yourself to writers your age just let it all go your journey is different right. your journey is what matters to you right you can look at other people and say hey it's great that they're writing that much but just don't set your success bars for things you cannot control right you you are unique and the stories that you will write that are important to you are unique you are the first explorer 
on an entire continent, on a brand new shore untouched by human beings since the dawn of time. And every single thing in front of you is an opportunity and it's new and it's yours. And you are the only person who can ever go there. If you don't go there, nobody else will. Because this is yeah. your brain. This is your life. This is your experience. And this is what you bring to fiction. And nobody else but you can ever tell the stories that you can tell. So yep. it's worth the struggle and the pain of getting through the parts where you're just learning in order to show people your continent, your world that belongs just to you and that nobody else can see but you unless you take the time to show them. Yeah. So I guess that is it today. Do you have anything else that you wanted to add or? That's just, just be kind to yourself. When you are writing, yeah. be kind because you, nobody has to be, a, the, a, nobody has to write the perfect work of, of unimaginable genius and brilliance. All you have to do is tell a story that matters to yourself and you can do that. Yeah, and it will matter to somebody else. Yes. And your writing can make a difference in somebody else's life, but you have to get it out there. Yes, yes. In order for you to tell to, to be able to change somebody else's life, first you have to change yours. And you change yours by becoming the person you want to be. And that's just one step at a time. All righty. So um, we are gonna just going to wrap it up here. We are on all of the regular socials. We are on Instagram and at, on Twitter at A-I-A-R-W-I-P. And uh, you can also use the hashtag alone with invisible people or alone in a room with invisible people. We are also on Facebook with our page, our Facebook page. It is alone in a room with invisible people. We are on, I believe, Stitcher, Podbean, iTunes, Spotify. I think that's it. Um, you can find us at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com. You can find us at hollylyle.podbean.com. You can email us at show at alonewithinvisiblepeople.com if you have any questions. And, of course, we have the new uh, forums in Holly's um you know, Holly's writing classes.com. It is our podcast forum alone with invisible people. And we will have a, basically it's a post for every single podcast episode that we have. You can create your own posts as well, but they are in there and you can every, every week we're going to add some extra, you know, the, the next episode, um, topic. And we have some really good discussions going on in there right now too. I was excited yeah, to see we that. Do. Yeah, it it that was cheering me up seeing all of the every time I walked in there it was black or bold again so I would click on it and yes. yeah. Yeah, so feel free to drop in there. It's a, it's a safer environment than leaving, you know, public uh if, if writers can be very very protective of their work and their opinions and their ideas and stuff and and their feelings. So if you're not comfortable leaving comments on the blog, the writers discussion area for the podcast is uh, probably a better alternate. Yes. Um, so yeah, that has been what happens when, you know, when you hate what you write and uh, what you can do about it. That's it for this episode. We'll see you on the next episode. <laughs> yes. Yes. Write and have fun and be brave. And now a word from our sponsor. You want to write, you love words, you love fiction, but you don't know where to start or how to middle or where to finish. I do. I'm Holly Lyle, and I've been doing this professionally since 1991. And I know how I did what I did to go pro, and I'll be happy to show you what I've learned. Start with my free three-week flash fiction class at hollyswritingclasses.com.